Hey guys, I'm Janet on occasion, and today we are having a look at a blog. It is a little bit old at this point, I know. It's not news if it's not new, but uh, I thought I'd discuss it anyway, because I think it's an interesting article, and uh, I want to cover Cathay on my channel. I think it's an interesting, uh, well, new thing to look at. Uh, new in the grand scheme of things, anyway. This is all completely untreaded uh, territory, which I think is very, very cool, uh, both literally and metaphysically or something, I don't know. Either way, uh, we have a blog to look at. So Total War Warhammer 3, an introduction to Grand Cathay. So we're not gonna be looking at the um, trailer. I'm gonna assume that you've seen it already because why haven't you seen it? Come on, get with the program. Um, but we are gonna look at this blog post. So once again, thank you Ben Barrett for writing up a lot of fun things for us to read. So, hello, welcome back to TotalWar.com. It's finally time. Ahead of the screams of getting to the point, let's just jump to it, shall we? That's how I should start all of my videos. Although I like to think that you start all of my videos like that, so I don't have to. Yeah, so what is Grand Cathay? Uh, so Cathay, I know, we're, we're already going on a tangent. I've only read a header. But Cathay is actually an old word for China um, that uh, Europeans used when they were going over there to trade. And what is very funny is I wanted to find an example of this and I would have found uh, probably a better example online, but instead I found one in my cupboard. So um, hang on, I've got it here. So this isn't Chinese. Um, it is in fact Japanese. Um, it's sake. So if we look here, right, Nice bottle of sake. Uh, right on the front, it says, imported by Cathay Importers. That's right, there are still companies named after the old world of China still importing things from, uh, from Asia, which I think is rather amusing. So, you know, that's where we get the word from. Games Workshop never go that far afield when it comes to sort of naming their, uh, their universes. There's always something uh, rooted in, in sort of the real world. It makes it very easy to know what they're talking about, as long as you know all of the words ever. So, you know, or quick Google search usually uh, usually gives you a result, which I find fun. So, good thing. Yeah, it's just China, isn't it? So, Grand Cathay is the largest nation in the Warhammer world, far beyond the mountains to the east, past the lands of the dwarfs, the snow fields of Kislev, and even beyond the Ogre Kingdoms lies this incredibly ancient and powerful land, overseen by the celestial dragon emperor and his wife, the Moon Empress, and ruled by their children. It is a mysterious land of incredible military might. Massive terracotta statues come to life to defend the Great Bastion against the floods of chaos that come to Grand Cathay's doors. So, of course, the massive ca uh, terracotta warriors. We have, uh, well, terracotta statues. There's the terracotta warriors, um, sort of famous uh, Chinese, uh, uh, I guess, uh, landmark, historical landmark. You know, these uh, these buried terracotta statues, which is very, very cool. So they've, they've introduced that. We've seen them in the trailer. We see the gigantic, um, you know, constructs running around. So that's obviously a nice... Nice reference to the Terracotta Warriors, which I like. Got to have that stuff rooted in history. Just makes it more, uh, I don't know, more flavorful. I love it. So, uh, so we've got them already. Dragon-blooded sorcerers wield the magic laws of yin and yang in harmony to blast enemies from the battlefield. So this is where one of my biggest um, theories comes from. So I really hope we get to find out um, exactly which is the case. But I have two theories about how that exactly plays out. So obviously, uh, new magic laws, yin and yang. So with yin and yang, sort of, you know, in the real world, you obviously have uh, light and dark, uh, the sun and the moon, uh, masculinity and femininity, just sort of opposites, basically. The idea is that one has to, you know, has to exist for the other to exist. Um, so you've got that sort of perfect balance between the two, which I think is a beautiful description of sort of uh, order versus chaos and things like that. It's, it's all encompassing. Um, it's just sort of a, an acknowledgement of reality, especially in a world that is so metaphysical, such as Warhammer. So it's a really great thing to sort of draw in, uh, to take inspiration from. So I think that's a really fun thing. But with yin and yang, you think sort of, you know, dark and light. Obviously light magic is a thing within the eight laws of magic. Dark isn't. Dark is different because of, I don't know, they're really crap at naming things. I mean, they, they call China Cathay. I mean, come on. So <laughs> I'm kidding, obviously. But yeah, you have uh, uh, dark magic and high magic, right? That is what I think they are drawing upon there. Um, I think they're using all eight winds of magic to do these things because something about sort of dark and light that doesn't really draw upon those standard eight. I mean, you could argue death and light magic, but 
that doesn't quite feel complete enough or complex enough. If these are the only magics they wield, then I, I figured they would wield all of the magics. And the reason why they're able to do that is because of this dragon-blooded uh, concept. We all know that humans are uh, considered basically too weak to be able to, to channel all the winds of magic. It's too dangerous. They are far too prone to mutation. So Teclesian theory, right, that Teclis brought to uh, the Empire when he established the, uh, the Colleges of Magic, um, at the time of Magnus the Pious in the last Chaos Invasion, uh, that that was a way to stop that mutation from happening, right? It was to stop uh, basically human wizards from being too reckless. But maybe Cathay didn't have that, you know? They've got some wise old dragon leading the way here. Maybe, maybe there are ways around it that the dragons would know that perhaps the elves couldn't uh, couldn't exactly. Um, give to give to the humans of the empire. You know, it wasn't something that Teclis, uh either knew or, or was willing to give, right? Because of the inherent risk. So it could be dragon blooded is a literal thing that these sorcerers do have dragon blood. Okay, and that gives them that tolerance to the to the magic, and they're able to channel uh, all eight winds of magic to combine them into you know essentially dark or high magic uh, or yin and yang. You know, their sort of own brand of that. So it could just be that they have a better fortitude because they literally have the blood of dragons going through them, right? Whether that was gifted to them or whether there's some uh, some sort of um, uh, desperate housewives thing going on at court, you know, a bit of uh, a bit of saucy uh, action going on. Because of course we do know that there are dragons, you know, the children of the um, the emperor um, and and uh, the empress. They have turned into humans, right? So who's to say that they didn't? You know, get close to some of uh, some of the humans over the years, and there is actually dragon blood um, now, sort of in in the sort of the gene pool of Cathay. Who's to say that's not a thing? Or perhaps it's it's a less uh, obvious gift of just like I bestow unto you dragon blood, cast a spell. You're dr of dragon blood now. You know, some sort of um, uh, like dragon heart thing going on. You know, you now have the heart of the dragon. That kind of thing could be something like that. Um, but. What I think is, I think it's a lie. What I think would be the most interesting, and this doesn't necessarily mean it is, this is all speculation of course, but what I think it might be is that dragon blooded is just a way to say, oh, you're special. Because obviously the dragons, they, they look up to, right? They run the place. So you'd think, yeah, okay, if you're powerful, you have powerful magics and things, then you would have the blood of a dragon. So I think it's a metaphor. But I think what happens, because that doesn't offset the inherent risk. What if they, what if the sort of process of getting wizards is just brutal? What if it is literally round up everyone who can use any magic, go, okay, channel all the winds of magic now. Horrible success rate, you know, only like... 0.00001 of them don't immediately implode, tear a vo you know, tear reality apart and summon demons and just do horrible, horrible things, right? What if just so few of them manage it? But the ones who do, oh, they must have dragon blood. Is the only explanation. Okay, they were deemed worthy. Therefore, they are dragon blooded. What if it's literally that? What if what if it's just a way to say they're the ones who made it? Therefore, they must have the blood of dragons running through them. It's the only explanation. We've seen what happens to the other 99% of people that attempt this. You know, what if that is the case? And I like to think it's that. I like to think it's that because I just think that is sort of perfect for um, a faction that is described as having like, you know, ludicrous population. Just to go, yep, just throw more bodies at the problem. Eventually we'll, we'll get the best <laughs> results, right? And that is these powerful dragon-blooded spellcasters, which I think is really cool. I think that could be could be the angle they take but it's hard to say because we don't really know how benevolent or malevolent um the the sort of uh, the ruling classes of this society are we don't know yet not really but we do know that there's sort of you know uh dark and light you know uh, sort of um you know uh sun and moon right there's all these this dichotomy that there. there's this sort of uh uh opposite thing so maybe that's just the darker side of their culture is what rears these uh these spellcasters, you know, who knows? So I do wonder, that is that is the big thing that I really want answered. Uh, or perhaps just referenced occasionally, just sort of like, you know, the odd little clue snuck in, in classic Games Workshop way. Um, but that is a big theory that I have, which I can't wait to see, you know, if they do hint at sort of the how the sorcerers are created, whether it is simply they have the blood of dragons, 
for some reason. Uh, also, the the all the hanky panky that potential um, route to getting these you know dragon blooded sorcerers. It would explain all the eunuchs. If it is referencing the Han Dynasty, that could explain why suddenly all the courts are filled with eunuchs. Because you can't have all the humans running around with dragon blood, because that could really upset the balance here. And they are all about balance, right? So, that's something I'm also thinking of, but I mean, we don't know yet. All of these are as right as each other, you know, all these theories are equally likely, or it could be something else completely different. We have no idea, but I, that's why I love this stage of, uh, of what we've learned. We've learned almost nothing. So who knows? Who knows? So let me know your theory, or let me know which is your favourite theory uh, for that. Now, let's move on. There is more blog. We are only two sentences in so far. Classic Janet. So anyway, uh, right. Powerful artillery and well-drilled troops numbering in the thousands slay any enemy that dares make one too many steps. Then, of course, we have the trailer. Go watch the trailer. I'm probably showing clips of it, but go watch it if you haven't, because it's a great trailer. Um, whoa, y'all just came up with this? This is something that people always seem to say whenever Total War does anything, which I think is um, just ridiculous, frankly. Like, they don't own Warhammer Fantasy. They don't just make stuff up. They can't. Um, they aren't allowed to just, you know, come up with stuff willy-nilly. Uh, it all has to go through Games Workshop. So, well, not quite. Grand Cathay was first mentioned in the second edition of Warhammer Fantasy Battles and made sporadic background appearances throughout its history. Games Workshop have created and reimagined all of these fleeting references into a full army, and we put the army, along with their empire, into Total War Warhammer 3. This includes their own characters, units, magic, history, and much more. Much like Kislev, it's been an exciting and collaborative process with Games Workshop, and they will have several bits of news and information on their community site too. So, that is obviously incredibly important. Um, this is a Games Workshop creation still, you know? There is obviously a lot of work being done on the side of Creative Assembly to, you know, make it all match up with, uh, with their vision of, like, Total War, right, as a franchise, and um, sort of covered all the bases for making that game. Uh, but it's a collaborative thing, and what people don't realise is that Andy Hall, who's the head writer of Total War Warhammer 3, has worked for Games Workshop for years. They got a Games Workshop writer to write this stuff, you know, to write for Total War, for the franchise. It's not just a Total War writer who's always worked for Great Assembly. No, they've got a writer with pedigree, so, you know, it's it's the same as any, any writer with pedigree writing a new Warhammer novel or whatever, you know, it's the same thing. Um, so I don't know why people get so funny about it, but... Um, don't basically be thrilled we have more warhammer stuff coming it's brilliant so who are grand cathay's legendary lords so for total War warhammer 3 cathay's playable legendary lords are jao Min, the iron dragon ruler of the western provinces and lord shan yang uh and miao yin oh sorry i put the comma in the wrong place uh ruler of western provinces and lord of shan yang and Miao Yin, the Storm Dragon, ruler of the northern provinces and commander of the Great Bastion. Miao Yin is featured in the trailer above. So Miao Yin is the, is the uh, white dragon that we see, which is very cool. Uh, while you'll get your first glimpse of Jiao Min next week, which is this week, I guess, because I'm late with this blog. My bad. Anyway. Uh, in addition, we'll have much more information about both as we continue to introduce this mighty nation and its heroes to the world. So, not a lot of information yet on them, but great, great. I want to be drip-fed this stuff. I want this to last forever. I just want to get a new thing about Cathay every week and slowly get a get a you know big picture built up, see if it'll answer some of my theories, see if my theories hold any weight after the next few blog posts. So, hold on, dragons! The rules of Cathay are immortal dragons, who can take human form. As well as being extremely cool, this marks them, uh, them as incredibly powerful combatants, amazing sorcerers, and natural leaders. We'll dedicate a bit of time on that topic soon. So, um, yeah, dragons. Just dragons. Dragons are cool. Anyone who says dragons aren't cool is just wrong, let's be honest. So, alright, but what about the Celestial Dragon Emperor and his wife, the Moon Empress? Fair question. Yes, the Celestial Dragon Emperor still rules over Grand Cathay. He spent his time in the Celestial City above Wei Jin, contemplating the destiny of the Empire uh, uh, with his wife, the equally revered Moon Empress. So again, we've got the sort of sun and moon thing going on of yin and yang. So they are the uh, true power couple of the Warhammer world, older than most of the gods 
for they existed when the planet was colder before even the old ones came and pulled it closer to the sun. As they rarely leave the celestial court, and their power level is frankly on par with most gods, we knew uh, they were not the right candidates to be Cathay's legendary lords. In much the same way, you're not actually playing and deploying corn or Nurgle on a battlefield. Instead, their children provide a much more interesting prospect for the game. They are still extremely powerful characters with compelling family dynamics. Spoiler, the siblings don't get on. But with all the responsibilities of ruling and protecting great swathes of Cathay. So I do really like that um, the, the design ethos of Warhammer 3 does seem to be that even within each faction, there are reasons for the faction to be at odds with itself. You know, so the, the siblings don't get on, so you might see some civil war, or you will give an, an excuse to do some civil war, um, just to sort of add to the variety of who you'll be fighting, which I think is really good. Um, because, yeah, Warhammer, everyone has an excuse to fight everyone, so I think just really hard baking that in um, in such an obvious manner with both these guys and, of course, uh, Katarin and um, uh, 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 Kostaltin as well. They are also are at odds with each other. So I think that's really fun. Even the, even the sort of forces of order, you know, are kind of disorderly, which I think is kind of cool. So I like that. How does Grand Cathay play? As an empire, a people, and on the battlefield, Grand Cathay is about harmony. They are a defensively focused army, long standing against the tides of darkness that crash against their great bastion, over and over again across the centuries. Ranged and melee units receive buffs when in close proximity. This, I think, is a really fun concept. Their power, boosted as the yin and yang that runs through every inhabitant of the, the Empire, works in concert. This gives them incredible ranged firepower and a stalwart, hardy front line. They are slow moving and easy to flank, but their flying machines, alchemists, and dragon sorcerers are much to make the Empire a formidable one. So I think this is a really interesting um, idea that it has sort of actual um, buffs to your troops if you are playing in an appropriate manner. I think this would be a great starting army for anyone who hasn't played a lot of Total War before, or someone who's just not great on their micro. I think this would be a really interesting one, because it encourages you to have a balanced army of like frontline and backline troops, and to use them in concert, in a way that you are going to benefit, any any faction would benefit from using those in concert, right? To have your defensive units defending the, the offensive units that are ranged, right? To keep them from getting accosted uh, to make sure you have your your tanks defend your dps i think that's really fun that there are specific buffs that are granted to them that way it also means that more advanced players can occasionally just break from that knowing that there is a stronger tactical advantage to splitting up when appropriate so i think there could be some interesting stuff going on there um hopefully it the buffs won't be so big that you just always have your sort of units in couples and that'll be it um, and you know maybe you won't have to do much after that but hopefully hopefully it'll offer some more uh, variety but just encourage sort of a very um, unified uh, um, offensive or defensive I guess but you know what I mean I think it'll be nice I think it'll be interesting to see that um, sort of gameplay encouraged I think it'll be a good sort of uh, learning tool for a lot of people so uh, this gives them incredible range firepower and a stalwart hardy front line they are slow moving and easy to flank <laughs> I've already read all that on the campaign map, Grand Cathay must use the incredible wealth of the Ivory Road to fund their war effort and defence of the Great Bastion, the invincible walled fortress that borders the Chaos Wastes to their north. Defending it and launching assaults from it is key part of their campaign and will make or break the fates of mortals. So, uh, yeah, there's the Great Wall of China, but it's the Great Bastion. So, again, that is cool stuff to draw from history. And, uh, and yeah, we get to see something cool out of it. And hopefully that will lead to more interesting seed battles as well. Um, just as the, the extra fort settlements that got added, um, sort of uh, just, you know, there, there was the Phoenix Gates, um, obviously with uh, uh, on Ulthwan, but then the Empire had a few forts put up um, around their uh, mountains, which I think was really cool. I think it was a really fun addition. So we might see the Great Bastion offering like a similar unique experience there. Uh, hopefully more so because it's, you know, it's the Great Bastion. This place is no joke. Uh, I would also like to see the, um, the that big wall in the north of the Dark Elves. I forget what they call that. You know, in Nagarond. I'd like to see that developed into something rather than just being... just hanging out with the mountain terrain and not really stopping anything. So I'd like to see something be done there as well. But you never know. We'll see. Um, maybe with the combined map they might flesh that stuff out. But 
we'll see. So on the campaign map, Grand Cathay must use the incredible wealth of the Oh, again, I've already read that. Naturally, we'll have more information, a roster reveal, unit spotlights, and much more in the coming weeks. I mean, this I'm very much looking forward to. Just all of it. So what can we expect units-wise? Melee infantry mostly wielded uh, wield spears and halberds, all the better to protect their ranged troops that form the most powerful force Grand Cathay has to offer. They also favour spellcasters, with alchemists and astromancers having equal levels of power on the battlefield. So I do wonder if alchemists and uh, astromancers are somehow a uh, what the yin and yang casters are called. But I like to think that there's something separate to the yin and yang spellcasters. But who knows, honestly, because the thing is astromancers kind of exist as lore of heavens, right? So if it's lore of heavens and then whatever alchemists are, I guess, that's a bit more boring. I prefer the, the dark and high magic, but you know, the dragon blood allowing them to do it or whatever. That sounds a bit more meaty um, as, a, as a sort of a, a unique faction thing, but we'll see. We'll see. We need more information there. So they employ a number of flying units and call upon the power of the Terracotta Sentinels if the situation warrants it. I'm going to keep saying Terracotta Warriors. I really need to stop myself from saying that. But Terracotta Sentinels, if the situation warrants it, to back up their elite crossbowmen, artillery pieces and war machines bring destruction to the battlefield. Which, I mean, sounds awesome. All sounds a lot of fun. I mean, we've seen it in the trailer. A lot of fireworks being blasted at people. You know, a lot of rockets and things. And let's be honest, the, uh, the Hellstorm rocket battery is one of the most fun artillery pieces uh, in the Empire. So, yeah, in Grand Cathay, if they got similar units, then I'm all for it, frankly. So Grand Cathay is one of the most populous nations in the old world. Formed as it is from hundreds of tribes that gathered under the Celestial Dragon Emperor in years gone by. Thus, it has legions to call upon when needed. With the less trained forming a uh, sorry, with the less trained forming a fragile but effective front line, wielding weapons and riding horses as required. Though they are cheaper troops, their power level can far outstrip their cost when used in proper harmony. So this sounds really fun to me. The fact that they do have an emphasis on uh, having cheap like chaff uh, units that give you a lot more flexibility. At least that sounds to be the case. So you know, they're all a bit more. Um, well, they're less precious. You can you can send them off to do whatever job needs doing. Um, but if you are having to rely on them, thanks to that harmony thing, you know maybe they can uh, outstrip their value rather nicely, which sounds really fun. I think that's a really fun thing. Again, it just encourages you to use uh, your units uh, carefully and in sort of an orderly fashion, rather than just sort of monster mashing and you know and saying go, you know. I think that's nice. So, of course, there are still many surprises to be found in this ancient land, and we'll have the full Ross reveal for you over the course of the next couple of weeks. Well, that's all very exciting, but it's September, and I want to know about the future of sieges and minor settlement battles. Understandable. As we go into details on the unique defences of the Great Bastion that Grand Cathay can take part in, we'll also explain how sieges in war, uh, play in Warhammer 3. Beyond that, well, you could probably guess from the trailer who gets the highlight once Grand Cathay have had their moment in the sun. We all know it's Nurgle. Obviously Nurgle. Obviously. Obviously Nurgle. Welcome back to Total War Warhammer 3. Grand Cathay is here, and we will stop at nothing to destroy the forces of the Qian Chi and protect their empire. We'll continue in earnest next week with a look at the lands, law, and history of the mighty Eastern Empire. So, uh, Qian Chi is the name for Zinch. There's a bunch of others, uh, which I will get into. Um, and another, uh, another date, there's a few things I want to clarify um, about the translations and things. I know there was a, a post on Reddit, but uh, I'm looking into it to see if there's, um, uh, see how definitive it is. Because again, it does seem like Games Workshop has pretty much gone, oh, okay, what means, you know, we need a guy who's like the Shadow Boy. What means Shadow Boy? And then they Google it and go, oh, it's this. And that's the name of the Shadow Boy, right? It's that, you know, uh, very on the nose translations, which is fine. You know, I think that's great. Uh, it works with all the Empire, with all the German uh, naming conventions, even if they are probably a bit goofy to a German, but uh, you know. That's, uh, that's Warhammer. So, uh, yeah, I think that's it, guys. I think that's it. So I'm going to be sharing with you a bunch of other uh, Cathay stuff. Cathayan, uh, I believe, is the is the term for it. Cathayan things. So I will be uh, going over that in the next few weeks. Hopefully not late for the rest of these, uh, for these articles. Hopefully on time. <laughs> that's the plan. That is the plan. So I hope you guys are enjoying it. And let me know your theories about the stuff that we have only half heard about so far. Because I think there's some great stuff. Um, so sort of some great stuff hinted at 
that can be sort of, uh, uh, you know, not really reading between the lines, but you know, there's a lot we can infer from what little information we have already. So I'd love to see your theories on various um, uh, various workings and machinations of, you know, the Cathayan nation, Grand Cathay. So we'll see. We'll see. We'll see what we can come up with. Uh, we'll see if we're proven right in, in the weeks to come. So, guys, if you enjoyed this, comment, like, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care, guys. Also, just to say, I can't necessarily recommend this uh, sake because I never drank it. No, I use it in cooking. So, uh, drink responsibly. Eat your drinks. Ladies.